I see. Do you believe in God? Maybe once, but not anymore. What happened? We had a difference of opinion. I'm sorry to hear about the loss. Maybe it's time for you to renew your faith. So in the first film, we made a start at meaningfully changing your prayer life, or even resurrecting a non-existent prayer life, using the principle of holding God to his word, of the promises he made throughout scripture. We went in search of, of some promises, some covenants that God made, and then we prayed from the covenants, and we prayed to a degree for the covenants. And I promised in, in each of the subsequent films that we're going to build on that underlying principle and that foundation. So what we're going to look at today is something that Christ said in the Gospels, a promise Christ made in the Gospels. And on the face of it, what he promised, if we, if we let ourselves look at it, it's almost barely believable. Now the context is Christ is, it's towards the end, the very end of Christ's mission. In in the Gospel of John, it's chapter 16. So it's it's very much, you know, towards the end of the Gospel of John. But as far as Christ is concerned, he's he's pretty much hours away from arrest and crucifixion, barely days. He, he's in the last hours of his mission. And if we if we take to heart that 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 Christ knew the Um, the trajectory he was on he knew where this was leading his actions were deliberate and it's it's in it's called the discourses and it's in it's in the 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 bits of scripture of john which are the long discourses of christ he's coming towards the end and he knows it so he's really kind of in this appealing to his apostles and and what he says in in john 16 verse 23 Christ is recorded in the Gospels of saying, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Whatever, whatever, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. If we actually pause on that and, and think about that for a moment, that, that's like whatever, that's anything. Whatever you ask God in my name, he will give you. I mean, that, that sounds suspiciously close to omnipotence. That's, that's huge. That's massive. So what do we do with that passage? Do we, do we look at that and think, well, you know, Christ is getting towards the end of, of his mission and maybe, you know, he's, he's, he's getting a bit excited. He's getting carried away. Um, he's exaggerating slightly. What I'm asking is, do we put that passage, that verse, that promise of Jesus, do we put that in the category of hyperbole? Do we say, "Mm, okay, he said it, but. Well, if it was a one-off, if if, if that's the only time where we, we can see something of that ilk said, then maybe, you know, you could sort of try and sweep it under the carpet and chalk it up as hyperbole and say, oh, you know, make allowance for it. But. The truth is, it's not the only place. Let's have a look. So John 16, 23. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. John 14, 14. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. John 15, 16. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. John 16, 24. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. John 14, 13. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now I look at all those passages together, and they strike me. They are a number of very subtly different ways of saying the same thing. So firstly, that makes me think he meant it. He meant what he was saying. It's no accident. It's not hyperbole. Secondly, I'm going to indulge myself here. I think it shows how how extraordinarily good 
as a coach, as a teacher, Christ was. Because I know one one method of teaching and coaching is if you have a very, very important point to make, you make the point lots and lots of slightly different ways. You make, you make the same point over and over and over again in slightly different ways, in the hope with each individual you're trying to reach that one of those ways lands in them. It's like, it's like sowing seeds. And you say the same thing this way and that way, and you change it very slightly in the hope that, that they land. In this person it lands that way, in that person it lands this way. And it's, it, it's quite a masterful method of teaching. And so I think that's what Christ was doing. I think he, it was so important, he was saying it over and over again in slightly different ways. Now, if we just expand that out, if we look at that, that verse, that, 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 that concept in a slightly broader sense, and we look through the rest of the Gospels, what we find is it's everywhere. Matthew 21, 22 says, whatever you ask for in prayer with faith, you will receive. Matthew 7, 11, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Mark 11.24 Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. John 11.22 But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And so the place I want to end this little batch of this collection of verses that all seem to be saying a very similar thing is probably the, the best known of these types of promise. Um, and it's Luke eleven nine. 9. It's certainly probably the most cited. And it's uh, where Christ is recorded as saying in the Gospels, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. We're going to come back to that first bit later on in the film. Okay, so what does all of that mean? Christ said the same thing lots and lots of different ways, and he made a fundamental promise. His promise, John 16, 23, whatever you ask the Father, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. If we're going to turn this, this, this promise into a prayer, then whatever you ask the Father, God, Yahweh, El Shaddai, Yudevavhe, the Lord, whatever you ask God, in my name, he will give you. In my name. What does Jesus mean, in my name? Is he talking about his, his kind of like, his name tally? Was he, was he talking about his, his name tag, you know? Hello, I'm Jesus, how can I help? Is he describing his, 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 his John Doe, his Joe Schmo, his handle, what he goes by, what his friends um, in market know him as? Is it almost like his calling card, you know, hi, I'm Jesus, here's my card, mention my name, it will be fine. Is that, is that where he's coming from? So we need to look at that word translated name. Now, in the Greek, what the, the Gospels were originally written in, in the Greek, the word translated name is anoma. And it appears over 200 times in the New Testament. And the vast majority of those seem to be in the Gospels and the book of Acts. Christ himself uses that, that word, that phrase, so many times, as you've just seen. And so the Greek word anoma. So, okay, yeah, one translation of it is, is name. But it has this historic meaning, this historic gravity, which is it also means authority. It's a word that could be used to represent a cause. A fair translation would be fame or even reputation. And in the concordance, there is one definition, which is the manifestation or revelation of someone's character. And so the word anoma, it, it's not merely a title or a handle. It's not really a John Doe, a Joe Schmo. It's, it's more than that. It's richer than that. 
But let's do what we promised in the last film, which is let, let, let's look at what Christ himself may have been referencing. So the word name in the Old Testament appears hundreds of times, 800 plus times. Probably one of the, the, the best known stories in Israelite culture around Jesus's day would have been the story of the angel of the Lord, Malak Adonai, in the camp of the Israelites. It's Exodus. And there's this, I'm just going to, I'm just going to read it for you. So the context is that the Israelites are, you know, that they've left Egypt. They're in the wilderness. They're with Moses. And God has promised his presence in the midst of their camp. God has promised to go ahead of them as a, as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. This was a story that they would have known. And here's a verse that Christ almost certainly absolutely intimately knew. And I believe was referencing when he was talking in my name, because it, it would have been such a strong phrase to a first century Jew. And I'm just going to read you the passage. It's, it's Exodus 23 and it's verse 20, 21. And this is, this is God. This is Al Shaddai, the Lord, the God most high, speaking to his people through Moses. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions. For my name is in him. For my name is in him. So let's have a look at that word, the word that makes over 800 appearances in the Hebrew Bible that's been translated name. The original Hebrew word is Shem. It's kind of, it's like Shem, a bit longer, Shem. It, it, it does mean name, but it also means reputation. It means authority. My authority is in him. Authority in action, my power is in him. In Hebrew culture, we're told that it, it's as though the name of the person was the person themselves. The essence of someone, their attributes, even their presence. Commentaries go on to say that the name of God was therefore not a mere word, but the whole of the divine manifestation. And when it's used to describe God, it, it's almost like the glory, the radiance, the numinousness. This idea that we have in our culture today, that, that name is, is kind of like your title, your honorific, your, your, um, what you go by. And in Hebrew culture, your, your name represented so much more. It was your essence, your presence, your authority, but also your, your radiance, what you embodied and what embodied you. Now let's look at some verses that seem to support that. Because if we read these verses as if name means what we know as name, they kind of don't make sense. So the first place we're going to look is Genesis 12. Now this is not, by, by any stretch, this is not the first time uh, in the Bible you see the phrase, the name of God, the name of the Lord. Um, certainly Genesis 4, there's, there's a mention of Seth and mankind first called on the name of the Lord. But I want ones that seem to support where we're going with this. So Genesis 12, Ab Abraham, it's not even Abraham yet. He's not even had his name changed, so it's that early. Abraham has just entered Canaan territory. So he's just got into the land that's going to be eventually become the promised land. And, um, and verse 7 says, Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So there's that promise. So the Lord appeared to Abraham and then said, spoke to him. And there he built an altar to the Lord. And then he moved from there to a mountain east of Bethel and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So in the verse before, he's the Lord has appeared to him and spoken to him. The next verse, he builds an altar to the Lord and he calls on the name of the Lord. It's almost like he's 
he's invoking the presence. He's invoking the essence or the radiance. Kind of like what's going on here. But if 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 it's the word for name that we have today, it doesn't make any sense. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. The Lord has appeared to him and spoken to him. That doesn't make sense if name means what we think it means. Let's, let's do the next one. So the next place we're going to look is Genesis 21, 29 to 34. But the context is um, Abraham and Abimelech. This is where they've, they've just made a, an important covenant. They've just sworn an oath to each other and they've made a covenant and they're kind of like in modern parlance, they've shook hands. And so verse 32 says, thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. And then so Abimelech and his commander, his commander of his armies, they leave, they go back into the land of the Philistines. And then verse 33 says, then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and there called on the name of the Lord. So he's, he's in the wilds, he's in, he's in the wilderness, he's, he's, he's in the open country, he's alone. The people he's just made an agreement with, sworn an oath with, they've gone. So he's got him, his tent, his livestock and the open country. And he's just made this oath. And then when he finishes making his oath, he plants a tree to, I don't know, perhaps celebrate or honour that oath. And then he calls on the name of the Lord. It's almost like he's, doesn't have a hint of worship in it, has a hint of, of communing with it. It's almost like he's, he's satisfied, he's done his bit, it's all, it's all worked out, and then he just wants to be with God. The, it's almost like the calling on the name of the Lord is invoking the presence or the essence. It's, it's not, but it almost feels like bringing God down into, into your environment. I, I don't know how to put it. So the last place we're going to look is Genesis 26, 20, 25. And this is, this is Isaac. This is Abraham's son. So it's much further in time. And Isaac's just been having a, a quarrel with some um, local herdsmen and um, they're quarreling over a well and water rights and they reach an accord. And so then he goes up to Beersheba, same place Abraham was. And verse 24 goes, And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. And it goes on to say, so he, Isaac, so Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. What I love about that is it just follows on and it's saying the Lord appeared to him, the Lord spoke to him and the Lord said, I am with you. And his recourse was to build an altar and call on the name of the Lord. Well, that doesn't make any sense. If, if God's already there with him and speaking to him and promised, I am with you. Then in this context, it's like calling on the, the name of the Lord is, 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 is almost honoring the radiance. It's honoring the presence. It's, it's, it's invoking deeper the essence. It's, it's almost got worship in it. So all of this is leading us to the idea that, 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 that the name, the name means so much more than, you know, that, that what, what it means to us today, that it is about authority. It's about power, but it's also about the essence of a person, the presence of a person. And referring to God, it's also the radiance, the numinousness, the glory. Calling on the name of the Lord is, it, it, it embodies all of that. And there's a really beautiful passage, I read it recently in a commentary, which says, I'm just going to read it. Very frequently, especially in the Psalms and the prophecies of Isaiah and in Jeremiah, the name stands for God himself. To forget his name was to depart from him. And that's a kind of, that's Jeremiah 27, uh, 23, 27, Jeremiah 23, 27. And so you have this, this concept that the name of the Lord is God himself. So then if we go back to the original, where we started this, Exodus 23, 21, where God is talking about the angel of the Lord, Malak Adonai, in the camp of the Israelites, pay attention to him 
Listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion, since my name is in him. My presence is in him. My authority is in him. My radiance, my numinousness. He is my, absolutely my representative. They're almost synonymous. And the verse that I love that seems to, to me to make this so unambiguous is uh, 1 Kings 8.19. And this is God speaking directly to King David about his son, Solomon. Okay, so this is God speaking. Nevertheless, you shall not build the temple, but your son, who will come from your body, he shall build the temple for my name. He shall build the temple for my name. Now, what are we, it's not like they're building Vegas. It's not like, you know, the name of God's going to be in neon lights above the temple. And we know the temple housed the presence of God. We know that the inner sanctum is where, is where the, the Ark of the Covenant and the, the very presence, the very essence, God's radiance, God's numinousness was housed. That's pretty explicit. He shall build the temple for my name. It's talking of presence. So then let's fast forward back into Jesus's day. And there's something Jesus says that I I just had to, I've got it written down here. I just had to write wow next to it. This is Jesus using the word name so much more in the context that we've just unpacked. John 17, 10, 12. This is Jesus talking, praying. My understanding is, I think this is Jesus praying to God about the apostles. And this is Jesus right on the cusp of going to his death, and he knows it. And he says, quote, all I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them, the apostles. I will remain in the world no longer. So he knows what's coming. But they, the apostles, are still in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. When I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. Protect them by the power of your name. It's like the the angel of the Lord in the camp of the Israelites, for my name is in him. God put his name, his presence, his radiance in him. And so now what do we have? If we go back to where we started, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Whatever you ask God in God's name, he will give you. This word name is is. Yeah, it's authority, but it's also essence and presence. It's a promise. This puts me in mind of a prayer. If in the midst of the Israelite camp, God put Malak Adonai, the angel of the Lord, and said, my name is in him. God has put his name in the angel. And Christ said, whatever you ask the Father, in my name he will give you. Then, in the name of God, ask God to put more of his name in you. It might look something like this. Father, you said, through the prophet Jeremiah, you said, if I call on you and come and pray to you, you will listen to me. Well, Father, I call on you and I'm praying to you. And you said, anything I ask in your name, you will give me. So, Father, in your name, I ask that you put more of your name in me. In your, in your radiance, I ask that you put more of your presence in me. Put more of your authority in me. In your name, put more of your essence in me. Now, it might seem like a bold prayer, but if you don't know what to pray, you're praying what Jesus, what God told you to pray. 
and you're praying into the promise of God and you're praying for the very thing God promised and you're pray- and you're praying for the thing that, that could only make that better in your name put more of your name in me how could that be anything but irresistible to God now if you're thinking maybe this kind of language is reserved to Abraham and, and El Shaddai God and to Jesus and it's just not that there's there's an astonishing passage that 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 seems to somehow so reinforce this and it's mark 5 7 and it's you'll know the story it's uh jesus is in the uh region of the garrisons and there's a man who's tied up and he's he's demonic possessed demoniac and um it, we're in gentile territory because they're pig farmers so we're pretty sure there that was gentile territory and this poor guy, as he breaks free of his shackles all the time, he's in a pretty bad way. And Jesus approaches, and what I love is, um, all demons in the Bible, they instantly recognize Jesus. They knew who he was instantly. They all call him the same thing or, or similar things. They just knew who he was straight away. And this particular demon, or as it turns out, arguably even possibly 2,000 de- demons, because they called themselves legion and they went into 2,000 pigs. But whatever, a lot of demons... And then the man, the demon through the man, he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? And then he says this thing, striking. In God's name, don't torture me. The demon is calling on the name of God, beseeching Jesus just get your head around that. The demon is calling on the name of God. Now, in the Greek, the, the, the some translations would say adjure by God. I beg you to swear an oath by God. But some translations are in God's name. Don't torture me. So, so even the demon knew that, that to call on the essence of God, to call on the presence of God, to call on the authority of God, that they, that they had that right. Well, if, well, if they had that right, how much more you? What I also like is that, that, that to a degree, if you look at this, often when, when Christ did a, a, an exorcism, he just cast out the demon. He just cast out, get out of her, be gone. And yet in this one, in, the, in God's name, don't torture me. And Christ allows the demons to go into the pigs, the pigs run into the sea. It's almost like the demon asked in God's name and Christ, to, to a degree, honored the request. They made a request in God's name. And I think it's the only time that Christ doesn't just straightforward cast out that he he actually gives way. Is that the right way to put it? I don't really know. But it's like they knew they could ask something in God's name. And in God's name, Christ honored it. Well, I'm sorry, but how much more you? And we're talking about somebody here, Christ, who knew the power of prayer. You know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's with Peter. Somebody's just had their ear cut off. He's being arrested. And he says to Peter, put your sword in its place. And then he says, and I love this. He says, do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he would provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Well, 12 legions... In Christ's day, it's around 70,000. Christ is saying, in this moment, if I, if I asked of the Father for 70,000 supernatural beings, I love that passage because it puts me in mind of Joshua 5.14 where um, Joshua is looking down on Jericho and he sees a man with a sword and he approaches and he says, are you with us or against us? And the, uh, the being replies, neither. I am commander of the armies of the Lord, and now I'm here. And it's like, whoa. Like like that sense of presence, that sense of of authority is phenomenal. And Christ in Gethsemane says, I could call on 12 legions, 70,000 of those. I know what I'm doing. And I just, I I love that. I love that that shows us a demonstration of Jesus' faith in God prayer and in his own prayer
so what are we saying? Are we saying, and, and, I, and I only bring this up because I know we're going to get some feedback and flack for this. Are we saying, therefore, that, that if, we, if, we, if we now understand that level of the power of prayer and that, how, how that much authority is given to you in your prayer life, does that mean we can then pray to God for all the gold in the world? <laughs> no, because if, if in the name of God, if in the authority of God, if in the, if in the embodiment of God, we can't ask for anything that would be outside that which God embodies. We can't ask in God's honour for something that would be a contradiction to God's honour. And in the same way, you can't, in the name of God, you can't ask for something that is contrary to God's very essence, God's very presence, God's very meaning, in the name of God. So, so, so it is beautiful. It, it closes its own loop. It's like, from the presence of God, ask God for something that, 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 that he would wish for you yourself. And so prayer becomes collaborative. If you're praying from the essence of God, you couldn't pray for something that is outside the essence of God. And so it becomes a, a collaborative exercise. Now, the last place I want to look um, fairly quickly is I said we were going to go back to Luke 11, 9. And, and it, on the face of it, it won't make any sense. This is the bit where Christ is recorded as saying, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. But if you look at the Greek, the recording of that, the, the word ask, seek, knock, they're in a verb structure we don't have in English. They're in the, I think it's called the present imperative verb tense. And in the Greek, it's, it's a, it's a verb that implies not just action, but continuous action. And we don't have it. So it could be said that a more accurate translation could be ask and keep on asking. Knock and keep on knocking. Seek and keep on seeking. It's, it's, a, it's a verb tense that describes continuous action. Now, in Christ's style, he reinforces that a bit later, and I'm going to have to read this. In Luke 11, 8, he says, uh, the context here, he's saying, you know, you, you, the parable is, you're at home, uh, a friend knocks on the door late at night, and you've got nothing in the house. And hospitality was an important part of Jewish culture. And so he says, well, go and knock on, you go and knock on your neighbor's door. And even though it's midnight and your neighbor's like, hang on a minute, you know, it's midnight. My wife's in bed. My kids are in bed. It's midnight. You know, what are you thinking? And yet Christ says, he says, he, he won't get up and give you what you want because of your friendship, but because, quotes, but because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Now, if you look at the translations, of, of that phrase in all the different versions of the Bible, you have you have persistence because of your persistence, you have shameless persistence, you have impudence. He won't give you what you want because of your friendship, but because of your impudence, he's just going to get rid of you. <laughs> you have shamelessness, and in the King James version, you have importunity. It's like Christ is advocating persistence to the point of annoyance. And then if we skip further on, excuse me, Luke 18, 5 and 7, what's affectionately called the parable of the persistent widow. And this is important because we're going to be coming back to this in the films over and over again. In fact, I think this should form part of everyone's prayer life. Is, is The context is a woman is seeking justice from one of the judges. He's not really of the mind. He doesn't fear men. He doesn't fear her. And yet, again, because she keeps bothering me, because of her shameless persistence, because of her importunity, because of her downright audacity, he grants her what she wants. And then Christ says, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? Will he keep putting them off? In other words, be persistent with God. 
persistence to the point of annoyance. Now I had a period of really thinking about that and something that I realized in my own life, in my own prayer life, was that, was that, for example, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. That seems unbelievable. And so when I, when I prayed to Jesus or God, in God's name, put more of your name in me. I have to let that sink in. I, I just love that. When I first started praying that, I realized that I wasn't, I wasn't convinced. I wasn't in alignment with that. And, you know, as Christ says, whatever you pray, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Well, I, 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 I had struggled. I troubled. I had, I, I struggled or I had trouble believing that. What I found was the persistence, the praying that morning, noon and night, the praying that all the time, any prayer, all the time, constantly. What it did was it put it always in my mind. It put it always in my consciousness. And so in the same way that God says, when I walk in the midst of your camp, keep it holy. It was as if the prayer, I wasn't praying that prayer persistently to convince God. I was praying that prayer con consistently to convince me and it was like a process of osmosis or the, 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 the gravity of that prayer permeated me and then the subtle things of life that that I was kind of willing to turn a blind eye to or ignore suddenly because that prayer was at the forefront of my mind they had to fall away and also because I was thinking about it all the time I was dropping deeper and deeper into a, initially a wondering about it and then an understanding about it. And so the praying persistently, it's quite possible. And again, this is a teaching method. So, you know, I think Jesus was a fantastic coach. Maybe he's saying, you know, practice this over and over and over again, because the persistence changes you. It's not about convincing God. It's about convincing yourself, getting out of your own way. So you have this idea. Father, you said, if I call on you and come and pray to you, you will listen and respond to me. And you said, through your son, whatever I ask in your name, you will give me. So Father, like the angel in the camp of the Israelites, in your name, I pray that you put more of your name in me. In your essence, in your presence, in your numinousness, in your radiance, I ask that you put more of your radiance, more of your presence, more of your essence in me. Now that's holding God to his word. <laughs>